I met Lena, my wife, of almost 15 years, years ago in high school. The following Monday, after throwing a party at my parents' farm for a bunch of my buddies because they were out of town, I asked a friend of my parents who worked for us to get me a couple of bottles of sour mashed potato. My cousin Terry got drunk out of his mind, which for him at that age, wasn't that long. Instead of staying in and sleeping it off, he decided he needed to go home. I managed to get the keys to the truck away from him, but he thought he was smarter than me. This butthole popped out the front door, figuring he could still walk the five miles to his house. And I let him. Apparently, a young lady found him about a mile away, crawling through the gutters when she went to retrieve the family mail from the mailbox because he couldn't stand on his feet anymore. That's how I bombed him before he left my parents' house after getting her father, a rather principled man, involved. She delivered my cousin to his parents' house. My aunt, my father's sister, had to clean up after him because Terry threw up more than once thanks to his stupid behavior. My parents found out about it, and I was punished. In their eyes, I had violated the trust they had placed in me. I was a horse's butt. It didn't matter what I said because they believed the worst. Eventually, my aunt expanded on what had happened. She managed to make it the worst thing humanity could do. I was mincemeat. If only she knew the truth about her son's behavior. There's nothing anyone can do when a person is blinded by faith and can't see reality. I accepted it and served my time. I realized at a young age that the truth doesn't matter most of the time. What matters is what people believe. From that time on, I changed my attitude toward everyone I knew. My father used to say that I had aged before my time because I walked differently than I used to. A young woman whom I had never seen before came up to me in the hallway before class, started after lunch, caught my attention saying, I heard that you throw wild parties at your parents' farm and there are a half bear girls running around. Are you really so irresponsible that you let your friends get away with it when they can't even walk ten feet? Who are you? I asked. And what the heck are you talking about? My name is Lena LeBlanc, and I found one of the men who attended your wild parties crawling in a ditch near my parents' house because he couldn't even get up to walk. I thought to myself, if you only knew how far from the truth that was, you'd realize how stupid you were being. But I wasn't going to tell her that, because I knew that her believing it wouldn't improve my reputation among my friends in our little town of Jackson. So I kept my mouth shut. It's not as bad as you say, I said, looking at her young hot body. But if you want to be one of them, next time we have a Saturday night party, that's fine with me. Her face turned red. She hissed. Can't you tell I'm not that kind of girl? No, maybe not. But you wanted to be. Your mouth says one thing. I said while your eyes and body language tell me something else entirely. Jet King. You're just a horse's butt, she said with a red face. True but horses' asses are meant to be ridden hard. I said, let me know when you play. She slapped me across the face and walked away in a fit of rage, but I managed to see the smile on her face before she slapped me. I stood there and laughed. I knew my reputation for the year was already established. Her words had made me one of the most popular in school that year. She has no idea about anything, said my cousin Terry, who witnessed the whole thing. Not one bit, I said. What the heck did you say to her? How the heck should I know, butthole? He said. You're a screwing idiot who decided to play a BS poker game of marksmanship with me after we smoked a joint each. I started laughing because my cousin Terry didn't know that I had put the deck on the line. Having said that, we headed to our first class. From that moment on, a game began between me and Lena. I played with Lena every chance I got, getting everything I could out of her. Every time I saw her in public, I made sure that it was obvious to anyone who saw me looking at her that I was undressing her with my eyes. It became so noticeable that one of her friends would start playing the song. Hungry eyes on her cell phone when she saw me. It was a way for me to get revenge for Lena LeBlanc punching me in the face. Yeah, I was being a jerk, but I enjoyed it. Plus, she had a body that didn't want to stop. I was just a fool, honest enough to admit it. If one of her friends asked me what I was doing, I would honestly say I'm interested in her. But Lena said we'd have a relationship when heck freezes over, and until that happens, I'd better respect her wishes. This only made Lena more upset because they wanted to know what I had done to make it happen. When she explained it all to them, they would laugh at what had happened or tease her about her reaction. 
Lena LeBlanc was hot in my eyes. Her roots were in the deep south, but a hurricane had cost her family to move to the heart of fly country. She was a red-haired Cajun with a body I dreamed about at night. She was about five feet six inches tall. She was tight, sweet with curves in all the right places. If you pissed her off outside of school, she could hurl swear words in Cajun French at a mile a minute. Okay, I'll admit it. I enjoyed seeing her get upset when her friends told her about what I was doing. The smile on my face when I saw her blush over comments made about our current situations let me know that I was enjoying it. I added to that when she put on a low-cut blouse, showing off her cleavage, letting out a long, hungry wolf cry as it echoed through the hallways. Everyone realized that Lena had put on something that made her look really good for the rest of the day. Every guy in school was clamoring to check her out. I don't know if she liked the attention, but I thought it was funny. I don't know how many times I caught myself staring at her tantalizing little horseshoe butt with a beautiful 36S rack, a narrow waist, and 34 hips. There wasn't a single sexual act I didn't think about doing with her. At times I fantasized about dragging her into the hayloft in my parents' barn. I never hoped it would lead anywhere because her family was well-to-do, and mine was not. She had the spirit of a wild horse that has yet to be tamed, if that is possible. She could be passive-aggressive or dominant, depending on her mood. A man who caught her would have to have the patience of Job because it would take so long to understand her before a plan could be devised that would work to get into her clothes. The more I studied her, the more I realized how complex a personality she was. That's how much her hot little body and personality turned me on. If there was any woman capable of giving me a blue balls attack, it was her. There were times when she would catch my eye, when no one else would notice. She would do something to tease me. We both played this game on purpose to frustrate each other. It took almost the entire school year before we both realized how much it worked. Everyone knew I was in butt lover, and there was nothing better in my eyes than what Leno wore on her frame. Once, when she caught me ogling three of her friends, she leaned over and wiggled their asses while laughing. Apparently her mother had told her that men who are attracted to asses end up being the most faithful husbands. She made the mistake of telling Flat Karen that, and soon the whole school believed it to be true. We were both going to graduate twelfth grade with honors. She became valedictorian, and I came in second. She thought that if they knew what I did outside of school, I wouldn't be considered at all. We were just rehearsing for our roles in the graduation ceremony that would be held in a month on the stage in the auditorium. I was supposed to be there in case she got sick. I knew that no matter what, she would come, even if it was out of spite. There was no way she would let me win by default. We were both recipients of huge educational grants. The last dance for the high school graduates was this coming Saturday. I was planning to attend Southeast Missouri University in the fall to start working on my master's degree in agricultural science. As we left the stage by the back stairs leading down the hallway, I ran my hand over her soft rear end and whispered in her ear, When will you be ready to let me knock on it? She turned around, slapped me across the face and said, When heck freezes over, butthole. When there was nothing left to lose and no witnesses around, I became a little aggressive out of frustration. I pulled her body to me and lowered my head, looking into her eyes. She resisted at first, but my determination took over. I had my only chance to make a score, and I was going to take it. Her eyes widened as I brought my mouth close to hers and kissed her forcefully with a deep, long French kiss. Making sure that when my tongue penetrated her mouth, I took it as if it belonged to me. I put as much passion and desire into the kiss as I could, deciding that if I was paying for it, I should get what I deserved. If this is going to be my first and last kiss with her, I'm going to make sure it's an unforgettable one. After I tasted what I'd wanted for so long, I let her go so that she could see how I felt about her. Her blue eyes, red passion, frustration, and anger. So I expected a big response. Instead, her reaction stunned me. She pushed me back against the wall with force and pressed herself tightly against me. She was acting as aggressively as I was. It was a complete turn-on for me. My hard-on grew instantly. Resting against her body as we shared another deep, long kiss, 
I could see how willingly I was giving myself to this hot jerk, and it scared me. Lena has shown me that she can be my equal when needed. She could be a tough cookie. I was shocked to death when she grabbed my crotch with her right hand. She must have recognized the size of my package to show how demanding she could be. She held it tight enough to tell me I was in control, but not to hurt. I've been waiting for this for most of the school year, Jet, King, Lana said. When you stop talking and start doing something, I'm glad you finally decided to be a man. Glad to hear it, I said. I wish you'd told me that months ago. Now would you mind loosening your grip? Not until you agree to exclusivity. Not until we decide to part ways. Lana said firmly, Deal. You've been the only one I've looked at since you slapped me, I said. I smiled and brought my mouth to hers again. This time I showed my tender side, kissing her softly and as slowly as I could. My hands rested firmly on the softness of her cheeks. I felt like I was holding a piece of heaven in my hands. Our kisses were both demanding, seeking, and open at the same time. Lana began to explore my slender figure. When we finally left the landing a few minutes later, because we both thought we heard a noise, we held hands. We both knew that our relationship with each other had taken a big step forward if we were anywhere else but school. I still believe to this day that we were so turned on and hot for each other at that moment that we couldn't stop our mutual attraction to each other during the school year had sharpened our feelings to the extreme. Those who saw us leave immediately realized that something had happened because they saw the smiles on our faces. Later, we learned that we were the subject of discussion in the corridors for the rest of the day. It was funny because neither of us were dating that year. After all, it seemed like we were both waiting for each other. I was waiting for her at the end of the day to walk to the entrance of the school to catch the school bus. She was walking with her best friend when she saw me. I was happy to see the way her eyes sparkled when she looked at me without saying a word. She handed me the school book she was talking to at home. How about we stop at the Dairy Queen for a milkshake before you drop me off at home? You and Jet Flat, Karen said, shocked. When did you two finally admit your interest in each other? If you ever saw a flat Karen, you knew what was meant when the boy spoke of her as a carpenter's dream because she was straight as a board and never nailed down. Sometimes we said she was a pirate's treasure because she had a sunken chest. I'll call you later tonight and explain everything, Lana said, as we walked out of the house, holding hands, and headed for my Jeep Cherokee Sport. We walked into the Dairy Queen, which was just behind the police station on the main street of town. She wanted a blizzard, and I wanted a regular shake, so I ordered them both in the larger size. We went to the city park, sat at one of the picnic tables, and started getting to know each other. It was about six in the evening when I dropped her off at her parents' house. Her mother saw me get out of the car and open the door for her. Her father joined her and eyed me as I approached him to ask permission to take my daughter to the dance on Saturday night. I think my actions shocked him because he didn't seem to know how to react. Lana told me later that he was shocked that someone our age was willing to be so respectful. Finally, he gave his consent and offered to shake my hand. I later learned that for him, showing respect spoke volumes about the way I had been raised. When years later I asked him for his daughter's hand in marriage, he didn't object as long as I followed his plans to protect his assets. After Lana walked into her parents' house, I got in the truck and headed to my parents' farm. I couldn't believe I had finally kissed the girl of my dreams. My parents immediately realized that something had changed in my life. It was unusual for me to arrive so late after school. So, of course, I had to answer my mom's question as to why I was so late. I simply said that I had gotten into an interesting conversation. My dad privately asked with a smile, Who is she, and what's her name? The redhead I'm asking to the school dance on Saturday night. I explained, I invited her tonight. That's why I'm late. From that day on, Lena and I were inseparable. It was Saturday, the day my parents went into town. I was in the hayloft, getting ready to haul a few bales of straw after cleaning out four stalls with the loader on the front of the tractor. I did this once a month, usually on the first Saturday of the month. The horses were in the paddock in the pasture. I carried everything to the edge of the loft and was just getting two down to spread them out on the floor of the stalls. When I heard Lena's voice calling me, I'm here, I said. I have 14 more bales to drop before I go down. 
I started throwing them over the side as fast as I could, and was about ready to climb down when I saw Lena's head sticking out above the floor. I went over to greet her as she finished her climb. It was funny how much flat space was open in the straw bales. A moment later we were lying with our arms around each other on bales of straw. Our mouths were closed and our hands were exploring each other's bodies. She, like me, was eager to get up from where we stood on the stairs. It wasn't long before she was pulling off my shirt and I had just finished undoing the buttons of her blouse, anticipating how I would feel her beautiful chest. When we were interrupted, Lena and I probably would have gotten carried away if we hadn't heard my parents honking. I realized my parents were trying to get my attention. By the time we got down the stairs, they were already approaching the barn. Lena and I started quickly spreading out the straw in the stalls. Mom and Dad caught us in one of the stalls, throwing straw at each other with laughter. Curiosity led my parents to the barn. Seeing a strange automobile in the yard when I wasn't around was all it took. They were pleasantly surprised to find that the visitor to the farm was a pretty girl about my age. It was interesting to watch the surprise on my parents' faces when I introduced Leno to them as my girlfriend. I told them that as soon as I put the bedding on the floor, I would saddle the horses and take her for a ride. Mom said, Before you do that, let's have lunch. Leno volunteered to help her, and they headed toward the house. First grade saved. Yet, my father said, I can't prove anything else was going on. Leno is better meat, just like your mother was at the same age. Don't do anything to ruin this new relationship, because she looks like a keeper. If you're thinking about it, make sure she's good enough to be the mother of your children first. My father was a practical man who called things as he saw them. He thus pointed out some important thoughts, for example, that our behavior always has consequences. It was then that I learned that my father had always had a thing for redheads. Dad helped me finish setting up the four horse stalls before heading back to the house. By the time we got back to the house, Mom and Leno had already become friends. After lunch, we went for a horseback ride and made it to the back fifty. After tying the horses to a low branch, we both got some new spots on the grass, leaning against a tree by the swimming pond where we had been earlier in the day. It was about five in the afternoon when she left to get ready for the school dance. While dancing that night, my cousin Terry overheard Leno telling a flat Karen that it was my sweet and gentle personality that she found attractive. Although we both teased and teased each other, we never did it. I like a man who can control his temper, and Jet has always done that. She explained to Karen and my cousin Terry, Jet can be aggressive when he needs to be. From what I've learned, Leno says, what I've learned about him is that his passive nature guides him in everything he does. But when he sets his mind to something, no one can make him back down. He proved that by waiting for me like I was the only one. His cousin Terry told me that when he speaks authoritatively, most people assume he's speaking in anger. Karen says that's because he has a naturally loud, strong voice, so over the years, he's had to train himself to tone it down. I'd do anything for Jet, Terry says, just like he is for me. Pee him off, and you'll realize you underestimated him. More than one boy here crossed him, and after he was done with them, they were lying on the ground in blood. When I picked her up for the last dance of the school year, her parents were surprised when I brought her a corsage because it wasn't a special occasion. They said it was the most beautiful bouquet they had ever seen. I explained that I had made it from plants that were part of a small nursery. My father and I had started on the farm. I made it a neutral color. So it goes with anything I said. They seemed very impressed. God, she looked so good in that white summer dress that emphasized her curves so favorably. All night I thought about her. There was no doubt in everyone's mind that we were now a couple. Yeah. She was a real tease to me, and she knew it. I think she was pissing me off that night, kind of paying me back for what we'd done to each other during the school year. Toward the end of the summer, we spent a lot of time in the hayloft. Mom and I had a long conversation after she found my stash of condoms hidden in a far drawer. It was then that she decided to have a conversation with the woman she hoped would be her future daughter-in-law. I must have realized what was said because shortly afterward, Lena informed me that she was taking birth control pills. 
One night at dinner, Mom put in her 002, saying the horses seem to like the stalls better, and they've gotten much sharper in the pasture. I wonder if it might be because the straw has taken on a new odor. I almost choked on my food and started coughing, and my dad looked up and said I missed something. My father noticed my interest in gardening at an early age and encouraged its development. Thanks to his guidance, we turned 20 acres of our 250-acre farm into a Christmas tree farm. We brought in tiny trees on the cheap with a reforestation grant. After figuring out what type of tree was best for the Christmas market every spring break, we spent an entire week planting rows and rows of new seedlings for the produce down the row. It was a time of togetherness for my father and me, about two weeks before planting. We would tell the plot to prepare it depending on the weather. We did this three or four times before leveling the plot. This made it quick and easy to plant. As a result, we had already begun to promote our first crop ready for sale the following season. We had about 400 trees, about 8 feet tall. All that was left was to prune them, to make them perfect for the retail buyer. We even figured out how to label them so the buyer would know whose farm they came from. In sixth grade, my father, understanding my interest in growing plants, said that if I took it seriously, we would have to find a way to replenish the topsoil. The city of Jackson and my father made an arrangement to bring all the trash collected in the yard to a site we had set aside for the mass production of topsoil. Our neighboring town of Cape Girardeau did the same thing shortly thereafter, because it was easy and convenient, and it saved them a lot of money. Twice a month, at least from an early age, I spent a day or two chopping up twigs and stuff to make mulch, which could then be filtered through large sieves to sift out the non-biodegradable stuff that had to be burned in oil drums. We scattered the ashes from these items along the boundary of the plot because we wanted to get the end product as clean as possible. When the pile reached a certain size, we added chemicals to stimulate the writing process and keep the moisture as high as possible. Once or twice a month, we turned the heap over, making sure that air was getting into it to keep it loose. Local building contractors soon learned that they were allowed to dump excess soil to us without a removal fee. It was mostly a version of Missouri red clay, using chemicals designed to accelerate decay. We mixed this soil with a biodegradable mulch. We created over time, this side of our growing business took over quite a few acres. The key was to keep the soil well ventilated and moist. We did not anticipate that after topsoil was removed, some of the soil donated to us would be used to level and grade the land on which we built our greenhouses. It took us 18 months to turn useless dirt, suitable only for making bricks into high-quality topsoil. We used it for bedding for new plants in our greenhouses and sold some of it directly to the retail market in 10 pounds bags. In the first three years, we made enough profit to build two large long glass greenhouses. Heated in the winter from gas furnaces, both were filled with growing flowers that were shipped to local wholesalers when needed, using lots of PCP tubing and an expanding hose system. We designed an automatic watering system that hung from the top down. We used the same principles in watering our crops. Excess water was collected by a drainage system that my father had built into the concrete floor and fed back for reuse. In this way, all the fertilizer lost through daily watering was saved and used again when 50% new water was added. This was a very efficient way of cutting costs and saved us from having to build a pond to collect the fertilizer because of its excess in the water. Over the summer, we would build four more greenhouses to grow white and red poinsettias for Christmas, and eventually there would be ten. My father decided that with the money we were earning by working together, I could graduate without debt. I still remember the first time Leno saw our operation. It helped her understand why I chose this field for my career. My father told her that it was my inquisitive nature that helped make this business a reality. Jet was asking questions. My father said, It got me thinking. After discussing it with my wife and getting her blessing, the family got down to business. It has now become a major source of income, and it's steadily growing. What was this farm used for? Lena asked, before it was here. Raising beef, my father explained, which you probably know about since fluctuations in the market can be good or bad, depending on wholesale prices. By the time I graduated, we had 22 greenhouses, 240 feet long, 
40 feet wide, and 9 feet high. We were delivering high-quality organic produce on a weekly basis. Our customers demanded more produce, so we expanded again. Two of our greenhouses grew leaf lettuce for the grocery chain. Two grew bok choy, and two grew English cucumbers. We had 20 employees and continued to grow. Our produce was grown without chemicals advertised as organic and demanded a higher purchase price from wholesalers. As a result, our finances were doing very well. As expected, I joined the family business and took over full-time. Elena became a family nurse practitioner and joined the group associated with Southeast Missouri Hospital. Within a week after she received her license, I proposed to her. Three months later, we were married in a hurry because she was carrying our daughter. Our two sons were born a year apart from the day we were married. Lena was spoiled by both my parents. They thought the sun rose and set for her. Mom was beyond excited to be a grandmother and became our nanny. Our children gave her an important new purpose in life. Children to this day reflect the morals and values she helped instill in them. We had just celebrated our 14th anniversary when my cousin Terry and his wife Karen took me aside at a family barbecue. They couldn't help but notice that Leno seemed to have taken control of our relationship because I seemed too passive and relaxed. It seems that many of our mutual friends have become concerned about our future as a couple. At times, Lena treats you jet, Karen said. You get the impression that she treats you like a second-class citizen and sits on you until she finds what she's looking for. To put it bluntly, Cousin Terry said, Lena may say she still loves you, but we all think she's lost all respect for you as a man. She's displaying the attitude of a mother who's tired of being one, even for you. I tried to defend her as a husband should when faced with something like this, but my cousin and his wife blew me off jet. Lena is always complaining about what you don't do. She turns every little molehill into a mountain. Karen said, You don't argue or swear. You have lowered the power of your voice so much that she can't hear you at all. You see her complaints and resent them because you think she's picking on you. This has caused you to stop listening to what she has to say. You have done more to update and modernize your business than you have done for your marriage. Your marriage can't be called equal because Lena leads you and you just follow her. Terry says Lena is using your softness and personality to increase her dominance over you, and you don't realize it. You were just too blind to see it. Each of you are displacing the other in your own way, Terry said. You work long hours because you don't want to go home, but you won't admit it. Lena, in turn, finds excuses to do the same. Some of our mutual friends have reason to believe she's developed a romantic interest outside of marriage. Later, I was busy making dinner on the flat grill when Lena asked me to bring something over. I thought seriously about what Terry and Karen had said. Looking back on my and Lena's marriage, I came to the conclusion that in many ways they were right. After listening to my cousin and his wife, I said, Don't you see? I am busy. Why don't you do it yourself or send one of our children for it? You've been treating me like I'm your servant for too long. Frankly, I'm tired of being your doormat. The shock on my wife's face spoke for itself. Lena finally heard the voice she thought no longer existed. Everyone within hearing distance was silent because I seemed angry. Lena turned and went into the house to get it feeling out of place for the first time in a long time. Daddy, what's gotten into you? asked Luna, my 13-year-old daughter. I've gotten to the point where I can no longer tolerate the feeling that your mother is treating me like a servant. I replied so that everyone could hear me. If your mother doesn't change her attitude toward me, our house is going to be turbulent for months. Everyone in attendance just had an awakening. I realized that for most of our married life, I had turned my cheek because it wasn't worth it to me to fight over it. I made it so that without struggling, my wife could walk on me like a doormat. That night, Lena and I had a big fight. I'll be honest, it had been brewing for a long time. I ended up sleeping on the couch. Toward the end, Lena said, You just don't know how extra you are. And that's when I blew it. We were fighting outside so the kids couldn't hear. I grabbed Lena, in pure anger. I turned her over my knee and spanked her like I did with our children when they misbehaved. She went into the bedroom in tears with a very red butt and locked the door so I couldn't get in. 
To say that Lena was tiptoeing around me the next morning is an understatement. Lena had just been rocked by a new reality. When my wife and kids left home the next morning, I returned from the huge office built near the greenhouses to see what I could find. As I lay on the couch trying to figure out when the change in our marriage began, it came to me that it was eight years ago. Just a couple of months after my mother died, after doing a thorough search of her bedroom, I found a wrist bracelet with a bunch of little charms on it. The problem was that they were all custom-made in 18-karat gold, and I wasn't buying them for her. The charms were so sensual that she would never be able to wear them in public. I knew they must have been custom-made to order by her lover because they were very expensive. I quietly put it in my pocket to take with me because I wanted it to be appreciated. It lent credence to Karen and Terry's suspicions. I went back to my office and was very quiet. When people asked me about it, I just said that I had a lot on my mind because it was true. Around three in the afternoon, when one of the office staff was in my office, I asked her to call the group my wife was in to see if she was accepting new clients yet. I'd love to do that, but may I ask why? Fiona asked for personal reasons. I need to check what my wife's actual work schedule is. I said, some rumors have come to my attention that I need to prove are not true. Well, finally, someone has the courage to tell you what we've been hearing for months, Fiona said as she walked out the door. Fiona, Karen's sister, was a military widow who had joined our company while her husband was in the service. She was now raising her daughter alone. I often wondered why she couldn't find another man. Fiona was the complete opposite of her sister. She was beautiful. My wife, in all the years of our marriage, was the only woman who had caught my attention. But after seeing what Fiona had to offer in her femininity, I realized I was still young enough to start over. The freedom that came from knowing I had another choice seemed to bring peace to my state of mind. Although I had known her for years, thanks to Terry and Karen, I hadn't paid much attention to her. For some reason, I experienced the excitement of the unknown again. It was an amazing feeling for me. When she returned, the information she gave me was quite revealing. Her work schedule was not at all what I had envisioned. Instead of working Thursdays and Fridays until 10 p.m. every week, she only did it once a month. Like all the other doctors in their office, Fiona and I chatted for quite a few minutes. She tried to ask questions without making it clear what she was asking. I don't know if she realized it, but she planted a few thoughts in my mind that gave me hope for my future. This gave her a lot of unaccounted for time. It was surprising to learn that she only worked half a day on Wednesdays. Now the question was what she was doing with all that free time. Eight years ago, when a big accident took my mother down, my father and I were surprised to learn that she had left her shares in the family business to me, entrusting them to her three grandchildren. When I was a boy, they had sold most of the farm at an inflated price to a corporation, leaving ten acres around the house in their name and another ten in mine. The corporation paid off the mortgage for ten years with interest. They gave me the land as a wedding gift from Lena and me. Lena and I built our house on that land. My father took the loss of his wife hard and went off the grid for a few months afterward. At that time, I became president of the company and my father retired as our first CEO. He still came in three mornings a week to keep up to date and act as an advisor. I knew I had a big business trip coming up in a couple of weeks during which I would have to visit eight different company offices to renew contracts that required my signature. They were all multi-year contracts with product line extensions, which gave us the opportunity to increase costs as it was a three-country trip. I had to be away for at least three weeks. My father and I were still in charge of our company, which now employed over 100 people. We had more than 48 greenhouses, all producing maximum output. Fortunately, in my first year of full-time employment, I checked the site for possible underground water veins, and we found one that would supply us for years to come. When we turned off the county water, we cut our total expenses by 10000 a month. An added plus was that we discovered a huge cavity of natural gas. And since the land had been in the family for generations, we discovered that we still owned the mineral rights. After negotiating with the big companies, we found ourselves in a win-win situation. Even after paying for what we used for heating, we received a nice monthly royalty from them. 
My cousin Terry, who was our CFO, came to my office to brief me on the latest cash flow statement, which showed that we were in line for the biggest year of growth in the history of the company. It was during this private meeting that I told him what I had discovered. He was as shocked as I was when he scrutinized the report. Looks like the man she's involved with has a lot of money. What do you plan to do, Jet? Terry asked. Send someone else to sign the contracts. No, I'm going to pretend. I have no idea what's going on. I said that will give the private investigators I'm going to hire plenty of time to find out who my wife's lover is. Why? It won't matter in divorce court. It's a 50-50 state. Terry said Lennon's father, Leonard LeBlanc, was, and still is, a conniving son of a jerk. I said, before Lennon and I were married, he made us sign a prenuptial agreement. I guess Lennon forgot about it. Why did he do it? Terry said, is he worth millions thanks to fracking? To protect his daughter from me ever getting a piece of her inheritance. I said if we divorce because of adultery, the guilty party walks away with the clothes, and that's the end of it. When I got home that evening, my attitude had clearly changed. My wife seemed to have a respect for me that I hadn't seen in years. I think we both realized that our relationship had changed dramatically. Leno was undoubtedly trying to find out what I thought I knew. It was also interesting because that morning, my father had decided to go on a two-week fishing trip with some childhood friends. They had been trying to get him to do it for years, but he always made excuses. He would be gone until I got back the whole time he had been away. Leno had been home much more often. It seemed suspicious, and I had the feeling that there was something going on in his life that he didn't want me to know about. A few days later, my daughter called me and told me that her mother was frantically searching for something lost and asking all three of my children about it. Daddy, Mom accused us of going into your bedroom and going through her dresser drawers, Luna said. What she can't find must mean a lot to her because I thought she was going to cry. When I returned home that evening, I asked Leno about it, but she stated that it was nothing important. When I told her that our daughter had told me about it, Leno replied that our daughter must have gotten the wrong impression and that she would clear it up with her after dinner that night at dinner. I looked at her the way I'd looked at her when I'd bullied her when we were at school. This time, her mood changed dramatically, and she became awfully... I assumed that Lennon now believed that I knew about her affair. After dinner, as she was putting the boys to bed, my daughter asked me what was going on. Luna. I'm not sure, I said. People have informed me of something, and if it's true, things are going to get a lot worse around here for a while because it's going to take your parents a while to sort it out. Just remember that this situation didn't arise because of your behavior or your brother's behavior. It's been three weeks since I discovered the bracelet with all the charms on it. The six charms were valued at 8,000 each. The platinum used in the bracelet along with the gold put the chain at 20,000. Whoever gave her this piece of jewelry, it was made by one of the most famous jewelers in the jewelry business. Since all the charms were unique, they were bought to commemorate special moments or events in these two's relationship. If you figure that she received two charms a year, perhaps for her birthday an anniversary that works out to about eight years. I didn't want to believe it, but the circumstantial evidence was pointing in a direction I didn't even want to consider. That's why I rearranged my schedule to accommodate the stop and get what I needed. I had booked a hotel room in St. Louis to get a full report from the private investigators before I went further on my business. And here, my fears were confirmed. My wife's lover for almost eight years was a man I had known all my life. He was my father. The private investigators provided me with a written copy and a flash drive on which it was all recorded. After the gentleman left with full payment in hand, I read the entire printed report. It was so detailed that I don't know how I didn't throw up. Luckily, on the way back from Canada, I bought a couple bottles of scotch at the duty-free store and drank more than a couple of strong shots while I read the report. Mustering up my courage, I called my former father, Leonard LeBlanc, and asked for his personal email account. Leonard was a proud man who held his own values, and I hated what this report had to do to him personally. Yet I knew that if I didn't tell him the truth, he would help Leonard destroy me during our divorce. Why the heck would I do that? Leonard asked. Because I want you to know what's in store for you, I said. Because you wouldn't believe it if you heard it from me. 
This dossier was handed to me about two hours ago. It cost me 6000 to get it. When I received the letter, I sent it to him via my laptop and waited for the phone call that was about to follow. Leonard LeBlanc would have seemed like the epitome of Homer Pyle when you first met him. He was over six feet tall, but he was as clumsy and awkward as the rest of them as a boy. He was the son of an alligator hunter whose father got lucky and got rich with his ordinary manners and simple words. He gave the impression of a dullard. Many were led away because they underestimated his genius, which he hid from most when he was interested in something. He would start researching it from the lowest floor. Many CEOs were shocked when, after signing a very tough deal, they found out that he had only been working for them for six months when he was in charge of the corporation. He already knew how to improve their profitability and productivity by using their weaknesses against themselves. He would have already shaved millions off their starting price. As soon as my cell phone rang, I answered it as I expected. It was my father-in-law, Jesus screwing Christ. Yet Leonard said you were right. If you had told me, I would have called. You're the biggest liar in the country. How much worse is it going to get from here? I'm going to do the same thing to them as you did. I said there will be no mercy for either of them. I don't blame you for anything, son. He said I'd burn anyone for what they've done. Just promise me you won't do anything before we talk to you, and our words won't be recorded. Leonard LeBlanc was a religious man who never attended church once in his life. He had his own views on life and what was right or wrong. And whether you liked it or not, you had to respect this man for holding those views all his life. His support said it all. Dad, how about we go fishing with the boys the first Sunday after I get home? I asked. You can call your daughter and arrange it tonight if she'll be home. He laughed and said, I like that. This way we kill two birds with one stone. I need to know what made you suspicious. I found a bracelet with a bunch of charms on it. Appraised it and found out it was custom made. I said last Monday, when I was in Montreal, I arranged to have it shipped to my wife from Paris. It will be by courier one piece at a time to arrive at her workplace with a note. I will contact you and your lover at the appropriate time so that you can find out the cost of my silence. All sixteen pieces must be in her possession before I return home. Jesus, Jet, she's going to turn into a lunatic. And so is he, Lennon's father said. So why? It will give me time to find a buyer for my shares in the corporation because I'm going to sell my father's dream. I said, because it's the only thing that can hurt him as much as it hurts me. It will throw them off balance psychologically for the near future, I explained. Their fears will become more apparent as the date of my return approaches. How much more do you have for this trip? Leonard asked. I have two more weeks to live out of a suitcase, I said. From the day the first courier letter hits my eyes, they'll be the walking dead. It would have been easier if they were dead, Leonard said. Murdered like it was an accident. After he picked up the phone, I relaxed, knowing that Leonard LeBlanc wouldn't wait for anyone. Being from the swamps, he knew how to solve a case without asking questions. I was in the heart of New York City, staying at the Trump Hotel, where one of the many restaurants offered fantastic dinners with some of the business people I was dealing with. Luckily, I was scheduled to head home on Friday. I was still sitting at my desk when the detectives came to me with the unpleasant news. It was well after 9 p.m. My father was dead. I was shocked. I had to ask what had happened. Apparently, my wife and him decided to take a swim in the back half of the pond that Lena and I used to spend a lot of time in when we first started dating. On Wednesday afternoon, while the kids were at school, they went for a horseback ride and decided to cool off. Dad went there before Lena because it was a hot day. The local authorities believed that someone had dumped a pet alligator in it a couple of years ago, and it had adapted to its new home. My father's body was found by divers after they killed the alligator. All three of us realized the circumstances. My wife Lena was fine, but she had big emotional problems. The fact that her father-in-law was gone right before her eyes shook her to the core. Our children stayed with their grandparents until my wife got the situation under control. I returned to my table and explained to those who were still there what I had just learned. Then excuse myself to attend to a few personal matters. As I walked back to my room, I couldn't help but think about how I never wanted to get on Leonard LeBlanc's bad side. 
I wondered what he had planned for his daughter. After making myself a stiff drink, I made a phone call. Leonard answered right away. The first thing I asked was, how are the kids? Fair enough for the middle lines, Dad said in slang. They're upset, but no more than what I consider normal for kids their age. If they're still on their feet, can I talk to them? I spent the next hour talking to all three of my kids before they gave Grandpa his cell phone back. From what I understand, from what Leno was able to explain, Leonard said your father drowned because an alligator dragged him away with it. They found his bare body with several dead animals in the refrigerator. His body wasn't bitten, but it has a few scratches on it, so I would suggest a closed casket. Thanks, Dad, I said, seriously. I'll be home Saturday morning to take care of the funeral arrangements. I'll let you go because I'd better call my wife and see how she's handling it. Sounds good, after all. At times like this, you have to keep up appearances, he said, before saying goodbye. I called Glenna, and from the reports, she was in serious condition. It was to have a conversation with her, because she wouldn't stop crying. She couldn't understand how they might not have seen an alligator before, since they had a horseback ride every Wednesday. I asked if it was normal for the two of them to go swimming bare. Lena couldn't take it anymore and dropped the call. Now she knew. I knew the truth. The next morning, I had a business meeting when I was called in by the very same two detectives I had met the night before. It seems that after my wife had fainted trying to drown her grief, there was a gas explosion that blew out part of the house. She didn't get out in time and was crushed to death by the debris. I came in and asked if I could speed up the process because I needed to fly out as soon as possible. Luckily, they understood me, and I ended up getting a better deal than I expected. I was lucky enough to catch the last plane to the Cape that evening as I stepped off the 12-seater plane. I saw my father-in-law waiting for me. My wife and I are counting on you and the grandchildren to stay with us until things are settled. Dad said that will give you time to get things organized and settled. How's Mom handling it? I asked. She was having a hard time until the police informed us this afternoon that she was your father's longtime mistress. Dad said they confirmed their suspicions when they found the blackmail notes Lana had been receiving in your father's office. That's interesting, I said. It must have bothered them. What shocked them was that they found a bracelet with 16 different romantic charms, all of them undressed. Dad added, it could be seen as a model of what lovers did in those days. Of course, they plan to talk to you when the funeral is over. How do you propose? I arrange to meet them, I asked. It's simple. Take the prenup and the private investigator's report with you. Give them to them right away. It'll prove you had no motive to frame them. I smiled, because I knew he said it to remind me that all deaths, until they are proven one way or another, will be treated as suspicious. The more candid I was about them, the less chance they would consider it a murder. Dad and I went to the funeral home office together to pick out a casket. We decided on a closed casket for both of them. I then contacted Terry at the office and informed him that the contracts were signed and that I would be taking a few days off. There were lots of guests at the funeral and tea party for the lovebirds. I think my kids handled it well. All things considered, I kept my cool as much as possible, but there were times when I showed it. Many people thought there was a closer-than-usual relationship between the two, but nothing was said publicly about it. The detectives waited respectfully while the fire inspectors prepared a final report on what caused the gas explosion in my house. They ruled that the cause was a faulty installation that had been carried out while I was away from home. I was told that once I received the report, I could legally sue the gas company for negligent death and loss of home. They found nothing to establish the time the alligator was placed in the pond. I showed them the pretrial detention agreement and the private investigator's report using my father-in-law's printer. I gave them a copy to take with them. They thanked me for disclosing this information because it resolved any outstanding issues that may have arisen when others reviewed their final report and made a judgment on the situation. Lana's father and I were sitting on the back patio drinking cold beer remembering my conversation with the detectives when he said, My wife and I are going to change our will, leaving everything to the kids in a living trust that will be controlled by you until they reach the age of 30. Do you want to know if I had anything to do with what happened? Dad, it doesn't matter, I replied. 
Karma has rewarded them what they deserve. Let's leave it at that. Leonard smiled and said, I always knew you were a smart man who knew what to say when it was needed. The kids and I were at Macy's making major purchases that overwhelmed me when Fiona ran into me. We moved into my dad's house while we remodeled mine. It was stale and in desperate need of repair. She volunteered to help. Fiona, we're buying things because we have nothing left. I said, let me introduce you to my three children, Luna, Leon, and Levi. It was decided to start with the boys, after finding out what the boys liked and didn't like. We got to work. We collected enough underwear to last two weeks. T-shirts, blue jeans, shirts, and other clothes followed as soon as I could. I paid for what we picked out and carried it to the car. By the time we were done, I had made six trips to the car and was exhausted. The last trip involved buying new shoes. Daddy, why doesn't Fiona come with us to our temporary home? The children said. Then she can come back with you to help you pick out a new closet. I don't want your father to get the impression that I'm meddling, she said, and things that don't concern me. Daddy, said Luna firmly, I think you should go with her and then take her out to dinner to show her how much we appreciate her help. That's what we did after dropping the kids off and unloading all the stuff. We went back and she helped me. It took us a total of four hours, and I invited Fiona over for dinner. After she said yes, I called Luna to get her agreement, and then made arrangements on my cell phone to have their favorite pizza delivered. When I got home, I was asked the big question, Daddy, are you going to ask her out on a real date? And that was a question that has yet to be answered.